everyone and welcome to NeuroPsyQ. Today I'll be talking about the blue dot effect, which is also known as prevalence induced concept change. I am first going to go over the original study that explores this effect, and then I'll briefly review another article that reviews whether the presence or absence of feedback can moderate this prevalence induced concept change. So what is the blue dot effect? Well, people often respond to a decrease in the prevalence of a stimulus by expanding their concept of that stimulus. So, for example, let's say someone was shown a series of dots on a continuum from very purple to very blue, and they were asked to decide whether each dot was blue or not. After a little while, the prevalence of the blue dots is decreased, so the participants are shown blue dots less frequently than they were before. In reaction to this change in prevalence, participants tend to expand their concept of a blue dot to include dots they had previously excluded. This is prevalence-induced concept change, which is also known as the blue dot effect. So in the original study from 2018, David Lavari asked the question of why some social problems seem so intractable. He suggests that some problems never seem to go away because as their prevalence decreases, the problem expands to include instances that it had previously excluded. He wanted to know if people were susceptible to this prevalence-induced concept change. So to find out, they showed participants in seven different studies a series of stimuli and asked the participants to determine whether each stimulus was or was not an instance of a concept. After participants did this for a while, they decreased the prevalence of the concept's instances and then measured whether the concept had expanded. So the seven studies ranged from simple to more complex, and in each study there were two conditions, the stable prevalence condition and the decreasing prevalence condition. So I'm going to go through the first study and then briefly touch on the six other studies that follow it. So in the first study, participants were shown a series of 1,000 dots that varied on a purple to blue continuum, and they had to decide whether each dot presented to them was or was not blue. The participants in the decreasing prevalence condition were told that the prevalence of the blue dots might change over trial, and after the initial 200 trials, the prevalence of the blue dots were de decreased gradually for this group only. These figures show the percentage of dots at each point along the continuum that participants identified as blue on the initial 200 trials and on the final 200 trials in both conditions. So the two curves on the left side are almost perfectly superimposed. This indicates that participants in the stable prevalence condition were just as likely to identify a dot as blue when it appeared on the initial trial as when it appeared on the final trial. On the right side, the two lines are offset which indicates that the participants in the decreasing prevalence condition were more likely to identify dots as blue when those dots appeared on the final trial than when those dots appeared on the initial trial. So, therefore, when the prevalence of blue dots was decreased, the participants' concept of blue expanded to include dots that they had previously excluded from this category. So the next four studies were used to test the robustness of this effect. Each study replicated the procedure of the first study with minor variations to see if they would alter the effect. In the second study, participants in the decreasing prevalence group were told that the prevalence of blue dots would definitely decrease over trials instead of saying it might change. As you can see from the graphs, this variation did not alter the effect. In the third study, a third of the participants in the decreasing prevalence condition were explicitly instructed to be consistent and another third were told the same thing and were also offered a monetary incentive for following it. Again, as you can see, this variation did not alter the effect. In the fourth study, the prevalence of the blue dots was decreased gradually for some participants and abruptly for others. And again, this variation did not alter the effect. Finally, in the fifth study, the prevalence of blue dots was increased instead of decreased. As expected, this change reversed the effect seen in study one. So the authors found that this prevalence-induced concept change seen in study one proved to be remarkably robust and was not eliminated by forewarning, by instructions and incentives, by sudden decreases in prevalence, or by a reversal in the direction of the change in prevalence. So in the sixth study, they tested whether this finding generalized from simple concepts to complex ones. And they did this by using a series of computer-generated faces that varied on a continuum from very threatening to not very threatening. As you can see from the figure on the right, the prevalence-induced concept change still occurred when the concept used was more complex. 
Finally, in the seventh study, they wanted to test if this effect would occur if participants were asked to make decisions about purely conceptual rather than visual stimuli. So participants were shown a series of proposals that varied along a continuum from very ethical to very unethical and asked to decide whether researchers should or should not be allowed to conduct the study. They suspected that moral judgments would be more consistent than other judgments, but they were wrong. And again, as you can see from the figure on the right, the prevalence-induced concept change still occurred when the stimuli was conceptual instead of visual. So why does this matter? Well, in some cases, prevalence-induced concept change actually doesn't matter that much. However, some concepts are meant to be held constant and should not be allowed to expand. An example used in the article is that if a person's concept of a ripe banana expands when yellow bananas become less prevalent, it's not really a big deal. However, if a person's concept of what counts as a crime expands because of a decrease in prevalence of that stimuli, it could be a problem. Lavari states that even though modern societies have made progress in solving a wide range of social problems, the majority of people believe that the world is getting worse. And he suggests that the fact that concepts grow larger when their instances grow smaller may be one source of this pessimism. So now I'm going to discuss another article that addresses this prevalence-induced concept change. So in this article, the authors basically replicate the blue dot test with minor changes, and they find that adding feedback does prevent prevalence-induced concept change from occurring. They start their paper by citing Lavari's prevalence-induced concept change and contrasting that to the classic low prevalence effect. The low prevalence effect is what has been found to occur in visual search tasks when target prevalence is low. What happens is, as the prevalence of targets is decreased, observers are less likely to detect the targets and fewer ambiguous stimuli are labeled as targets. For instance, observers from a study in 2007 searched for guns and knives in a stimulated airport x-ray baggage screening task and miss errors increased considerably when target prevalence decreased. So in this article on the effect of feedback, they describe the classic low prevalence effect and Lavari's prevalence-induced concept change as being contrasting effects, as one of them represents a narrowing of the definition of a target, while the other produces a broadening of the target definition. So they did two experiments, one using the original purple to blue dot continuum, and the other using stimuli from a shape continuum ranging from rounded to bumpy shapes. They showed participants a series of stimuli and asked them to determine whether each stimulus was or was not an instance of a concept. So for the first study, they had to determine whether the dot was blue, and for the second study, they had to determine whether the shape was round. After a while, they decreased the prevalence of the instances of the concept. There were two conditions, feedback and no feedback. So as shown in the figure, without feedback, there's a shift to a higher percentage of blue responses, producing a prevalence-induced concept change effect. With feedback, there's a shift to a lower percentage of blue responses for all colors in the low prevalence blocks, and this corresponds to the traditional low prevalence effect. The same results were found using the shape stimuli. So the experiments show that when participants are given feedback, the prevalence-induced concept change effect does not occur. The author then suggests that understanding the effects of prevalence and ways we can control them may be useful in socially important low prevalence tasks like cancer screening, airport security, and disease diagnosis. So that concludes my presentation on prevalence-induced concept change or the blue dot effect. Thank you so much for listening.